So this Friday, as Mike Kelly just said, July 18th, most of us will be at Soldier Field to celebrate the 50th anniversary of an athletic competition that changed the world. On Saturday, July 20th, 1968, she helped change the world forever for children and adult, adults with special needs. Just after marrying her sweetheart, legendary public servant Ed Burke, she was a young instructor from the Chicago Park District who organized this athletic competition at Soldier Field. She teamed up with Eunice Kennedy Shriver and they called it the Special Olympics. The world was changed forever and the Special Olympics is now celebrated around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke. Mm -hmm. Justice. Thank you. All right. I just, I, I can't read my own writing. I forgot to acknowledge Great City Club speaker, uh, the head of the Civic Federation, Lawrence Massal. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Alexa, Alexa Jamie from NAMI. Alexa, where are you? Did I say that right? Did I say that right? James, I'm sorry, I can't read this. And then from Haymarket Center, Dr. Dan Lustig. Let's give him a round of applause. Without further ado, Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jay. I, you know, after Mike Kelly and everybody speaking about Special Olympics, I don't think I really need to say too much, other than the fact that I'm just thank to God that I'm here and able to enjoy all the festivities and all of our Special Olympians enjoying um, what we have done for the last 50 years in the Chicago Park District. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, it came to uh, last night when I walked into the Weston Hotel where it's called Command Center for Organizing Things, I saw a team from Uruguay. Mm -hmm. And this morning, somebody told me they saw at the airport a team coming in from Brazil. They're going to be starting to play their unified soccer games today. I, I'm just overwhelmed with that uh, kind of uh, discussion. Having been out to Hyannisport, as Mike said last week, and listening to uh, the people around the world and the Greek ambassador bringing the cylinder uh, that they're, they use to light the torch for the Olympic Games to Hyannisport, to light the eternal flame that will be brought from Hyannisport to Chicago to light Richard Hunt's beautiful eternal flame of hope for Special Olympics. So I'm just overwhelmed with all of it. But more importantly is what the panel about is this morning. And it's about the Special Olympians, but more importantly, I think, for today, are the parents and the siblings and the families. Mind you, think back to 1965. There was no Americans with Disabilities Act. There was no special education. There was no special recreation. But there was the Chicago Park District who got a $10,000 grant to be the first municipal organization in the world to open their doors to people with differences. And the park district hadn't really gotten enough, I think, credit for doing this. It wasn't an easy thing to do. They, no one was a special ed teacher. All we had were special education teachers who raised their hand and volunteered and say, sure, why not? We always have a class of kids who are different. And some throw a ball farther than others, some jump farther than others. So we could learn to adjust our skills as PE teachers, and that's exactly what the Park District did. And then lo and behold, in 1968, we put on the first competition. So again, Mike, and all your predecessors, Tom Berry, Bill McFetridge, and Ed Kelly, and all the superintendents, for keeping this program forward, and especially now being the, uh, its own division, thanks to you, in the Chicago Park District, the first time, Jerry Hennigan, Mike Benevente, and all the other Park District people, it's their own division in the Chicago Park District. So thank you again.
But for the parents, thinking back to 65, it wasn't a real easy thing to try to have them bring their child to the park. Either they were in institutions or they were in a back room at home. And it was only by advertising in local newspapers, please bring your, now we say, special needs child to the park, we have a program for them. It wasn't something they were really willing to do, as you can imagine. Children were not brought out in the public. Some people were embarrassed. But many parents stood up and did. And the first, one of the first parents that did was Connie Cusack McIntosh's mom and dad. They brought Michael. Um, Connie, please come up. Michael, who is my first student, is 62 years old now. He competed in the first games until he retired in 2015. He currently lives at Good Shepherd Manor. Michael attended West Pullman Park and Marquette Park. He participated in the World Games and his favorite sports was swimming. Michael has won countless medals. And in fact, when we were at the games in Los Angeles, he jumped in the pool, won a gold medal, and got out, and he didn't have a swimsuit on. Remember that? <laughs> Didn't make any difference, okay. Our, our second uh, parent is Connie Hernandez. Connie, come on up. Amelia is her daughter. She is 61. Amelia, stand up so everybody can see you. Okay. Amelia also competed in the first games and still participates at Piotrowski Park. She works at El Valor Adult Workshop. Her favorite sport is floor hockey. She loves Cor Crawford from the Blackhawks. That's pretty good. <laughs> Amelia participated in the national games. Powerlifting, how about that? And she's won thousands and thousands of medals. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next parent is Vera and Mike Hurley. Come on up. I think one of you are coming, or both of you. I don't know. Okay. Their child is Sean, and Sean is 45. He has participated since the age of six. He's at Marquette Park and Mount Greenwood Park. He works at St. Xavier University, and this is his 24th year in Special Olympics. His favorite sports are powerlifting and golf, and Sean participated in the World Games in alpine skiing. On July uh, 10th, he actually he attended the PGA tournament with his unified partner, Pat Malloy. Okay. Antoinette Newsom. Antoinette, come on up. Now, Antoinette has two sons, Marcus and David. They are twins. Stand up, gentlemen. Come on. And both are Special Olympians. And both are in the Special Olympic program since the age of 28. They attend Bessemer Park. They work at South Chicago Parents and Friends Adult Workshop Vocational Center. Last summer, both young men worked as interns for the Chicago Park District during the six weeks summer camp. Marcus, his favorite sports are basketball and hockey. Raise your hand, Marcus. There he is, okay. And David's favorite sports are powerlifting and softball. We can tell, stand up, David, we can tell that, I mean, okay. And between both of them, they've won hundreds of medals. Our next parent is Laverne Barnes, Yay. and Mr. Barnes. Okay, Laverne, come on up. Okay, now Marcel Barnes will be 
43 years old next week. He has been attending West Pullman Park for over 26 years. Marcel is a drummer in a band at Kennecott Park, and the band has performed at Spring Games and the Olympic Town. His favorite sports are track and field, volleyball, and basketball. He has over 100 medals. He has been competing in Special Olympics for 35 years. Wow. Yes. Mr. Vasquez, Videla Vasquez, please come up. Now his son is Lucas. He is 22 years old, attends Vidim Park on Chicago's southwest side. He has been, okay, there he is. He has been competing in Special Olympics for three years. His favorite sport is what, Lucas? Bocce. Bocce ball. He has won approximately 15 medals, and he is a ComEd ambassador. He has also been a junior counselor on the payroll. How about that? Does your father help you take care of your money, or do you take care of it yourself? You're, you do it yourself. Okay, that's good. Okay. <laughs> he was on the payroll for the Chicago Park District Summer Day Camp two years in a row. Mr. and Mrs. Fallon? Oh, we have Mr. Fallon? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, one of you can come up. If, you want, if both of you want to come up. Now, their son is Aiden. Yes. Stand up, Aiden. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Now, there's something special about Aiden that just happened. He is in Sports Illustrated yes, this yes. month. Yes. Oh. Right? Aiden is 20 years old, attends Norwood Park. His favorite sport is what, Aiden? Powerlifting. Right. We know that because that's why he's in Sports Illustrated. Can't miss him. Um, Aiden just attended the National Games in Seattle for powerlifting and received fifth place in each event deadlift, bench press, and squat. In each event, Aiden did his personal best, deadlift 300 pounds. Nice. Oh. <laughs> Bench pressed 165 pounds. And squat 163 pounds. Wow. He only has a few medals on, but he has won approximately 30 medals. Aiden also attended Notre Dame High School and a re is a recipient of the Burke Scholarship. There is another Burke that also contributes to Special Olympics. <laughs> All right. So welcome, everyone. So for the most part, the gentlemen have to stand. All right. So what we'd like to talk to you about is your Special Olympian, of course, but most of all, your Special Olympian and how your Special Olympian has affected you and your family and your community. And I think we like to start from the beginning. Um, and I think I'll start with Connie, and you can tell a story about how your family came to be part of Special Olympics, because it didn't exist, actually, when you're going to talk. That's absolutely right. Um, my dad was a police officer um, in Roseland, and he read in a neighborhood paper that um, this program was starting at West Pullman Park. My parents had been advocates for my brother's whole life. He was born in 1956 with Down syndrome. Um, and as Anne said, there was nothing. There not only was there not, there was no law, but there also were, were no services. My parents, and I'm sure many parents were, it was suggested that they not even bring Michael home from the hospital, which of course they thought was preposterous, but it was commonly done then. Um, for that very reason, their future seemed very bleak. There was um, nothing to be done for them. So 
my dad took the squad over to uh, West Pullman Park and met Anne and signed Michael up on the spot. And in so doing, he signed up for the family business <laughs> because um, the park program in particular and Special Olympics ultimately has become woven into the fabric of my family's entire life. Connie has uh, three sisters uh, who grew up uh, with Michael, and they all were counselors, and Connie's still involved, <laughs> and so were they. Yeah, my, um, my, so my parents started out being advocates and brought all their children into um, this movement of um, inclusion and equality and social justice. And my children um, all participated um, in, in special recreation park programs. My uh, one daughter <clears throat> being um, is a um, coordinator uh, of a therapeutic recreation program at McGuane Park. So she's doing what Ann did um, all those years ago. And my granddaughter is one of her counselors. So we do have four generations now that have been a part of the movement. I'm really proud of it. Antoinette? Yes. Could you tell us about your family and your boys and how you became involved? Sure. When they were younger, they, uh, I always looked for them to have something to do all the time had to keep them busy. So I tried a lot of different after school programs and I found Bestman Park, which is right around the corner from where we live. And the, the, the park was changing staffs at the time and it was an all female staff. And then this one guy came along and all the females left. But I had to keep them busy. And the coach told me, he said, listen, he said, I don't have a female staff. We have female athletes. I need you to sign up to be a volunteer coach. <laughs> because I cannot go away with the girls. And we jumped right in. And Special Olympics has been the best thing that's happened to them. My kids, my family, just grateful for this program. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Laverne, could you please tell us a little bit about your family and how you became involved in Special Olympics with your um, with Marcel? Well, try to go fast. Marcel does he's he's great. Uh, when you start out, we had the uh, zero D program. And from there, one of the uh, teachers had told me, she said, you know, your son can go further, board education. At that time, they had the special ed program in board education. So I thought I was comfortable with him like that. But we moved on, and as we moved on, he's 43 now. If you meet him, don't tell him I told you. <laughs> <laughs> he started out, they started with the uh, special uh, Olympics, but it wasn't in the schools where they went out yet, so they, they, we did it in the schools. He used to bring home his shirts that they had and what he did. So as we moved on and on, when he went to McKinley Therapeutic for High School, there was a coach there that they were doing Special Olympics, and they got Marcel started. I didn't realize how well he could do with sports. And as he moved on, the medals was coming in, and it made him to use, what do you call, patience, teaching him how to be calm. And as he moved on, he graduated, there was no other program, so we would go down state and volunteer. And we met a gentleman who was with the park district, he said, when you get back to Chicago, check West Pullman Park, which was near us. So we went, talked to the coach, Rosie St. George Hubbard, got started, that's how it began. And with the sports he loves, one of the most important sports he loves a lot is bocce. He gets serious. When he do the bocce, he's serious. You can't talk, don't bother me, I'm busy. I've got to do this. 
But I'm really grateful and I thank God for the program because a lot of times when you don't have things for them to do, you got to make things. And sometimes with their conditions, you got to keep it going. So I appreciate it. I, I'm thankful for it. I thank you for my husband who, who he got married. He just moved right in like he's Marcel's biological. And they work together. We go down state. We just go to help out and to do so. I'm grateful. And I'm good. Thank you, Laverne. <laughs> Connie, could you talk a little bit about Amelia and back when from the very beginning because she's one of our first athletes? Back when. Back when. <laughs> we don't have to say how long, right? Uh, yeah, Amelia wasn't developing, I noticed. She was the older. She wasn't talking. And uh, I knew there was something wrong. So when her brother then started school, she was going to be six years old and he was four. They asked me if I had other children I said, yes, but I mean, it just started talking. They said, bring her down. We'll let a psychiatrist see her, see if she was able to go to school. So when she was able to name the, all of a sudden she started talking, she started to name the colors of the Crayolas and the cars and everything. So he said, let's give her a try. I said, okay, brought her to school. I was all happy. So <laughs> two and a half hours later, they called me to come and get her. She wouldn't uh, sit long enough to learn anything. So I went and got her, brought her home. Then later the Board of Education called me and asked me if I was interested in a park program, and I said, yes, of course. And the park was nearby, it was Dvorak Park. Took her over there, and when I went there, I thought, wow, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. I met other people, other children. She took off from there. She was no longer that person that used to sit in the corner playing with marbles and little cars. She started associating with everybody else, and playing and everything, and then started Special Olympics then came about. She was 11 years old by then. And um, I was there at, at Soldier's Field. And uh, I was no longer that person that used to be not wanting to bring her out in public. You know, that all ended. Wonderful. Times have changed. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Fallon, maybe you could talk a little bit about yourselves and Aiden. Oh, Aiden. Janie. Aiden started in the um, Norwood Park Special Recreation Program, which is new to our area. It's only been around for 10 years. And he was one of the original members. He has enjoyed every sport that he has ever been involved in, which is flag football, uh, uh, bocce ball, what else? swimming, uh, everything. Um, this has become his second family. He doesn't want to be around me, <laughs> believe it or not, in the afternoon. He's he has very things interested. to do, right? He has things to do. He has his brothers and sisters at the park. We're so grateful for Special Olympics and, and how it's changed Aiden's life. He has um, grown unbelievably. We're very thankful. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Mike and Jared, would you like to add to this little discussion? Well, in 1968, I knew nothing about Special Olympics. We were in London uh, waiting to come to the United States and I was three months pregnant with Sean and maybe if it was today I wouldn't have gotten in, but we did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sean was born six months later and uh, I didn't drive, I didn't uh, know anything about Special Olympics until he was uh, probably four years old. And my sister introduced me to a, a lady whose son went to Marquette Park, and she said, you should go. So 
I had learned how to drive, not very well, but I had learned to drive and we started. And Jerry and her sisters and there probably was about 15 more we used to take to the park as volunteers. And uh, that's where Sean started. And he competed in every sport that was out there at the time, which was probably about 14. And now he's down to golf, weightlifting, <laughs> and bowling. And golf being his favorite. And uh, he works, a, he went to public school. Uh, his major accomplishment in grammar school was to sign his name cursively, oh. which, which he does, and very, very well. And after high school, he had been taught how to ride the bus, and he got a job at Daly College, and it lasted one year. There was a change of um, uh, whoever runs the cafeteria, and he was let go because he couldn't work the register. So uh, we got him into St. Xavier within six months, and he's been there for 24 years. Oh my God. And his job is very important to Sean, very important. Mm -hmm. So one day he works from nine till two, uh, Monday through Thursday. And one day he's in the cafeteria and there's a big meeting going on between the president and all of the president's cohorts. And Sean is hanging around and walking around and finally the president said to him, Sean, do you have a problem? He said, yes, I do. I have to clean this table before, before I can go home. So, so the president said, well, you heard the man. And they all got up to the table. So to be treated so well, and, and he has so many friends at St. Xavier, and he made terrific friends, both with the student body and with the staff. And Special Olympics, what can I say? It has been one of the greatest things that has happened to us. We went to Alaska for the World Games. He won a gold medal in, in downhill, and uh, a bronze in slalom, and a bronze in giant slalom. And he was up against Austri uh, Austrians and Swiss. <laughs> For a south side of Chicago, we <laughs> saw a hill. We were very, very fortunate, and I thank Special Olympics. Well, Videl, we know that your wife would have been here, but you've uh, actually stepped in for her. Yes. So, um, Videl is um, the father of our Olympians, Lucas, and maybe you could tell us about yourself and of the family. Yes. I'm here on behalf of my wife, so if I suddenly correct myself in the middle of my <laughs> sentence, you know she's listening. Just so you know. Uh, Lucas uh, <laughs> surprised us from the very beginning. He's a triplet. Uh, right from birth, we knew we were going to have issues. Uh, doctor said he'd never make it. Doctor said he'd never come home. Doctor said he would not thrive. Doctor said, leave him here. At one point in time, uh, the doctors were trying to convince him or suggested we eliminate him from the pregnancy. Um, obviously, we didn't. Uh, 22 years later, and uh, many challenges, uh, he's successful, he's working, uh, taught the family right from the very beginning when I took over what was called back then the Challenger League, uh, sports league for children with disabilities when he was young. Uh, I got the children involved, I got, uh, the league also provided the buddy system for each team had to spend or send 
uh, one of the teams to do buddy buddy with the team, my team, our team, or the team we were playing. Uh, to us, that's very important because at that point in time, we were teaching kids as young as seven, eight, nine, ten years old that it's not about only what you do in sports, but about what others can do. And reminding them that there are young people and adults out there that sometimes need uh, a helping hand, uh, even if it's uh, something as simple as showing up and cheering them on. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know what, a lot of times that's all they look for. Mm -hmm. uh, they look for acceptance, uh, they look for support, uh, and they need to know that what they do at, 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 and what they are successful in is the exact same thing that we do. Mm -hmm. And to see everybody here over and over again for the years, all I can say is, on behalf of the parents, I'm, and I apologize if I'm, if I'm speaking out of turn, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, today is Vidal's first day in retirement from being a Chicago police detective. Oh, awesome. And um, oh, thank, you. thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. However, Jerry Hennigan already told him, you are now a full-time volunteer, no days off. So she's, he's starting work today. <laughs> Justice Burke doesn't realize it, but she's already offered me up three times. <laughs> and I've not had my first beer yet, so go figure. Well, that's later, okay. <laughs> um, we all kind of talked about uh, the, uh, the feeling that you received um, as a parent because your child could accomplish. It was, and that was something that you probably n didn't expect, but were so pleasant, like Laverne said, so pleasantly surprised how great your son was at sports. And um, I think that Special Olympics has proven that once you feel good about yourself, you can go on to do other things. And that's the same for all of us. And in each one of us in the room, we all have differences. And in our, in our kids, our Special Olympians, are, have differences as well. But we all have the same thing in our hearts that we want to achieve, we want to do well. And it seems to me that looking forward, like Vidal said, is employment, better education, and being able to assimilate into the community. And how has it been since your child now um, is a little bit older, is out of school, and working in the community or participating in the community? What are the things that you could think of that we still need to do as a society to help our Special Olympians go further? Now, who wants to start that? Connie, I can pick up the okay. no choice. I knew she'd call me. She always does. Since I was 12, she's been bossing me around. <laughs> um, I can speak to that personally right now, something that my family, my sister Colette is sitting back there, and she is one of Michael's primary caretakers when, when he's home. He lives in a beautiful place called Good Shepherd Manor in Moments. It's a very tough decision at the time, and I think that people whose children are at the middle of their lives have to face their children's future post-parents, uh, what's going to happen to them later on in their life. We're facing that with Michael now. Michael is 62 years old. Nobody believed a person with Down syndrome would ever have that kind of longevity. Mm -hmm. So now we are working with a person who, for all practical purposes, is in his old age. Um, his, he is aging rapidly. Um, we are finding through our studies with the Adult Down Syndrome Center that, that see, they seem to be seeing that with aging DS people. Um, so I guess what I would like to see in my vision for the future would be more attention planned for later in life for our athletes. What's going to happen to them when they are in their retirement age? For example, Michael right now, in order to retire him from his day program, we had to declare him as a hospice patient, which brought a lot of, a lot of emotional baggage with us. We didn't want to put Michael in hospice. But all that means is that he's retired. He doesn't have to go to work. He gets to stay home every day, which is everyone's, you know, goal. And and actually, it Almost has improved can. his health. It has improved his um, his uh, outlook on life. But we won't know that. We don't know that. We're we're at a point now where 
we're taking the baby steps that Anne took in 1965 and that P P the pioneers took because we haven't gone this long before. So aging would be aging. my issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Connie, what do you think? Well, you know, we're not getting any younger here. And Amelia's 61 years old. She's at El Valor. I have wondered what's going to happen when I'm not here anymore. I know she's not ready to give up. I know my brother used to tell her, oh, when are you going to retire? And she says, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> she refuses. I mean, she just has to go somewhere. She goes to the park. She goes to work. She's just all over the place. And uh, I had said if she wants to go to El Valor, El Valor has a residence waiting for her if she wants it. But she says, why does she have to go there when she can stay here, you know? But she does have a place, you know. Uh, I mean, she may not be able to read and write or anything like that, but she understands a lot of things, you know, and I, 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 I see her just going along with it. Mm -hmm. um, La Laverne, what do you think society should be doing for our young um, athletes who do age out and don't have school anymore and have only part-time employment? What do you think we could we should be doing? I didn't have a. I have to go back to when Marcel was in the special ed program in board education years ago. I loved it. And I remember, I'll give an example, and I've just thought of this. My son was able to memorize. If you kept reading something, he'll memorize it. So one day, when he's the 03 program, she said, you know, your son go further. I said, yeah, okay. She said, he can read. I said, no, he's memorizing. She said, Miss Barnes, your son can read. I said, okay. So I got one of my husband's college books, and I told myself, read that. He read it, but he could read it, a book, memorize. I went to the back of the page of one of his college books. I said, read that. And when he got through, I said, oh, my baby could read. He can read. When they get older, it would be great if they had programs for them. How can I say this? That they can Make progress continue, and, continue mm -hmm. progress because... A lot of times as we get older, we slow down. But I found out up in your mind the way you think. Because if you sit and think, I'm not going to move, you ain't moving. They keep moving. They keep going. They try. It would be great if they had programs. Because, you know, most of the time we think about stuff like they talk about the money. I told you I take my hat off. It's there. They can have for them because they're important. A lot of times you... It's, it's a young lady at my church. She has uh, autism. And when you look at her, if you look at her like she can't do anything. I told her mom, I said, you know something? I believe she can read. But if you look at her and don't do anything, no, I can't read. I ain't going to read. I'm just going to sit here and look at you. But as they get older, I believe they need to push forward with some things for them that they can do where they can feel good about themselves, and then I'm through. <laughs> um, Antoinette, what do you have to say about this? One of my greatest challenges were, was transitioning out of high school. When they graduated high school in 2009, and there was nothing available for them. They had been on a waiting list since 2002 to get selected for a pun so they could have funding for another program. They did not get selected until last year. So they sat home for almost 10 years with nothing to do. And it was a constant fight just trying to find a program for them to get in. And it was almost impossible <clears throat> excuse me, without, you know, without funding. And that was really, really hard on them. My son Marcus, he did not accept it well because they were so used to always being busy. 
you know, their whole life from five o'clock in the morning till six o'clock in the evening, they were on the move. And from the time they graduated high school, it was nothing but the Park District program, which makes me even more grateful because that was the one thing that was constant. So I think what needs to be worked on is transitioning out of high school, having something available for special needs people right after they get out of school. People on... Um To your point is that people on Illinois Special Olympics, um, Jenny Fortner, um, one of our co-chairs of the uh, 50th anniversary, and Mike Kelly, they we've been kind of meeting and talking about this issue, and and if the Board of Education isn't going to do it, then maybe the Park District will be providing, hopefully in the future, some higher special education for those who are finished with the Board of Education. So we're asking for people who know things about this to help us do this and help us participate. And there's going to be a committee in the future, after our 50th anniversary. Like we've all said, you know, it's our job uh, in society to, to go forward. And I'm just going to give one little thought of what Mrs. Shriver told me when I first went out to Washington uh, and she asked uh, after I sent the proposal for the games. I'm 23 years old and I was meeting President Kennedy's sister and I was really freaked out. I had no idea. She called, said she wanted to talk about the proposal I sent her. Well, I was sitting there with her and she said, this is a good proposal, but it is totally unacceptable. Well, I've never forgotten those words. <laughs> but sitting there on the lawn last week, I began to think about it and what it meant to me, and it never left me. It means that what we do today might be good, but it's never going to be enough. It's going to be unacceptable. Special Olympics is great, but it's all unacceptable if we haven't continued what our parents have said is needed. So we need to go forward. Mrs. Schreier's words keep on telling me. She told me, Life is unacceptable. You didn't have your college degree. Go back to college. You'd be a better advocate for people who are vulnerable in society if you were a lawyer. So I had to go back to law school. So nothing was acceptable in my life. Now my husband's trying to tell me that. But I, <laughs> but I can overrule him, so that's OK. <laughs> so what are some of the things um, that, um, Janie, that you think we could be doing? Going forward? Yes. Um, getting our kids involved in the communities. I mean, this is, Aiden lives at home still. And that's he, a good thing. It is a good thing. Mama cooks dinner for you. She yeah. washes your clothes. Oh, I bet you help. Oh, he helps out. <laughs> and I think just, just being in our community, and he's out and about, and mm -hmm. people know him. They know where he lives. He's involved in you know, going to the grocery store by our home. Just getting our kids out there and letting them know that they're no different than anybody else sitting here. We all have differences. We all have differences, yes. absolutely. Absolutely. All right, how about the Hurleys? What do they do have to say? Well, um, unlike some of the parents here, we were very fortunate when Sean came out of high school. My sister worked at Daly College. She asked her manager if, uh, possibly take Sean on to do whatever. And uh, she said yes, and he got one year, and then uh, Canteen uh, lost the contract, and Sean was out of work. But Canteen came through again, and he got into uh, St. Xavier. And uh, they knew what he could, was capable of, he was capable of clearing tables and wiping them and keeping the cafeteria um, clean. Last year, uh, Country House took over at St. Xavier. And Sean was accepted as an employee, and he has been doing fine. So I would think that regardless of what you think a child's capabilities are, after they come out of high school. 
If you know anybody, anybody, if for cleaning or uh, janitorial work or maybe stuffing envelopes or putting stuff together, it may take a week, it may take two, but you will never, ever, ever get a better worker or one that is as conscientious as a handicapped or special needs person. Mm -hmm. So please spread the word. Help them get jobs. That is the main thing. Now, Connie has a different, and I don't know, you know, how we could help there, but eventually we will, we'll figure it out. Miguel, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. what, what do you have to say about employment and skill training and, and our responsibility as a community to make sure that jobs are available with people with special differences? As I sit here in this room and I, and I see all you out there, and all of us have our own relationships, all of us have our own networks, all of us have our own history in business or politics or wherever it is you've been successful in. Um, and I'm going to piggyback what, what you said, Ms. Hurley, is not so much that if you know anyone, but for all your friends and relatives or friends of relatives that have businesses uh, that can employ someone, with disabilities, suggest it. What I've learned over the years in trying to find Lucas a job is, I, is I've run into businesses where when I, when I bring it up to the owner, they literally had no idea uh, how beneficial it would be for them uh, to hire a young person uh, with disabilities. Again, you do get one of the hardest working individuals when you bring them on board because they don't stop. You tell them they have an assignment, and, and this is what they're going to do. If, if, and our, all, we're all the same. The one thing we taught our kids is, if anything, you will be a productive member right. of society like right. the rest of us. You will contribute. Uh, but the problem is we have people out there in the business world who, uh, and I don't mean to say this negatively, negatively, but they don't realize how much of an impact they can make in this particular part of society and yet appreciate and still appreciate and, 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 and look at them in amazement at what great workers they can be if you just give them a chance. That's all. Suggest to your friends, suggest to your people, hey, have you ever thought about, and let them think about it. You know, but put it out there because some of them still don't know that it can be done. Okay. Jay said there's um, a question. I mean, I, and, and we should open up the panel for yeah, questions. Absolutely. Okay, this would be great. If we have questions, um, somebody will please write it down and somebody will get it for you. Um, Mr. McGing has asked this question. Uh, can anyone address volunteer opportunities for those who would like to help? Any of the parents or maybe Jerry or someone else or Jenny or Kevin Magnuson? Who's, go ahead, Jerry. Our program has grown so much due to our volunteers. As Ann had mentioned, and Vera, like I started volunteering when I was nine. I've been with the park district 35 years and as an employee. Um, so in the park district, we have a lot of opportunities for um, our individuals with intellectual disabilities and any other disability to volunteer. We have you go through a volunteer process. Of course, just because we're in a park and we have our children in the program, a background check and stuff. But it's easy, not hard. Um, you know, at special Olympic competitions here in the city, like that event day is the lead for our special mm -hmm. Olympic here with the park district, and you could do one day volunteer. You know, so I can't even, he does over 70 events in the city. So the nice thing is. Mm -hmm.
amazing things and assisting students with disabilities within their college. Awesome. All it takes is one yeah. person. Yeah. One person to take that extra step. Come on a Saturday, volunteer. You know, we call it in Special Olympics world, you come volunteer, you're in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're yeah. fucking in. It's not about Mike or I or any of the staff that are running things, it's the athletes, and you won't walk away. So we have so many people that have been volunteering with us for 30 plus years yeah. because of the love of the program. You know, so there's lots of opportunities to volunteer with on a daily basis, um, getting your children or nieces and nephews in while they're in high school is the best exposure, as everyone mentioned, too. <coughs> Very hard with our special ed population, 22nd birthdays are out of school. Which I think I, I have an issue with. We in the parks do offer day programs and different opportunities. Um, we can't keep up with the, the individuals that get, you know, released from school, so to say, it's public school. You know, um, but like Vera said too, she gets to wait after your sister, her sister works for her. But it is like Adele said, it's networking. Just ask somebody to get a, a, an individual with a disability an opportunity. If they don't know how to help the person, tell them to ask them. Ask the person. You know, don't just assume he or she can't do something. He or she, as Ann had mentioned, they're some of the best workers I've ever had working for me through all the years, from a thousand years of city workers when we did JCPA and all these different programs we had through the years. Um, but yeah, so I think Mike and I are around. We're in the park district. You can find us anytime, you know, for any of our programs to volunteer. And I think uh, getting our high school age students and family members, that's the age to get them in. And then maybe I'm focused on what they'll choose as the college free. <laughs> One is the training location citywide and over 80 calendar days, so there's something for everybody in your community or around our high school. And we have special skills for it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. A good example of what great employees we have. Marcel would not take off of work today to come to this. <laughs> but I, when you talk about volunteers, all of our Special Olympians, they volunteer as well. And I'm looking back in the room and I see Melanie O'Brien. Her brother, Kevin, was one of my students. He's no longer with us. but. He volunteered at a nursing home. Can you believe this? That's pretty much his whole life. That's what he did. He volunteered. He was a Special Olympian swimmer and uh, spent his whole life part of our family. I want to thank all our siblings, our parents, and friends of our Special Olympians. You have changed the world for everyone else to have their eyes open to what our children can do. Thank you so much. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So, just hold on, stay up here. Just hold on. We get, we're going to give you, we're going to give you all mugs. But there was one other question, and that was, and I'm going to have Justice Burke answer this as I pass out these mugs down the hall here. Uh, if you could just help me. Thank you. This is your uh, gift from the City Club. Thank you. Justice Burke, what is the significance of the fifth star on the flag? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Well, Jay, you forget that I'm a judge. I ask the questions. I don't give answers. But this one answer I will give you. You know, our Chicago flag is a beautiful flag, and it represents four different things that happened in Chicago. Um, the Chicago fire, which is kind of sad, um, the Fort Dearborn massacre, which is sad, and the two uh, world fairs, which are wonderful one-day events. But I think the star should include, the flag should include a living star, a, a, a reminder that Special Olympics has been living and changing the world for 50 years and will continue to live and change the world forever. So we, we need your votes eventually, not now. We'll worry about it after our 50th anniversary. Thank you. <laughs>